Hello and welcome again to uh, this series on 1 Corinthians 15. Uh, thank you for the emails and uh, comments that are being made by many of you that are being deterred uh, from considering full preterism after now finding out what it actually teaches and I'm encouraged by that. We're also on Facebook where uh, I'm engaging in a debate of sorts with uh, Mr. Preston and that certainly has been uh, uh, lively as, as well, or rather lengthy, but nonetheless quite exciting, at least as far as I'm, I'm concerned is. It's nothing new, it's repeating of the same time text, you know, gone and on and on, and then connecting resurrection of the dead and saying it must have happened in, in AD 70, and uh, therefore the resurrection of the dead has absolutely nothing to do with the body. But anyway, we're continuing on with 1 Corinthians 15, and we're at the place where it says that Christ has indeed, this is the Christ that died, was buried, and was raised again, bodily raised again. And it says here, Christ has indeed been raised, the perfect tense. Uh, in the Greek text, the perfect tense means that he is raised and remains raised. That means that whatever was raised, that's still raised. And very clearly, the text notes that what was dead and what was buried was what was raised and remains raised, okay? So I don't know how Mr. Preston wants to address that particular one because he denies that Jesus is currently, the man Christ Jesus, is currently in his body, uh, that somehow his body disappeared or something upon his ascension. But, you know, what that's... That's heretical in and of its own right, but, you know, but whatever. But Christ has indeed been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep, those who have, who have died. And we'll go into 1 Thessalonians 4 because this question comes up about what about the dead loved ones? You know, where are they? And Paul answers the question very clearly. But for right now, uh, my book, Exegetical Essays on the Resurrection, which Don, in the beginning of his uh, series presentation on this subject, uh, uh, touted my book as a must read quote unquote to understand Paul but I wrote this book this is the first edition of the book put out by Truth Voice back in 2004 or somewhere around there and um, <clears throat> here I, I get into this first fruits metaphor because in the covenant body view uh, the corporate body view in full preterism they argue that the dead that's being referred to and that's being denied is old covenant Israel and I went along with that in, in my book. But listen to this. This is uh, me back when I was a full preterist uh, touting what Don Preston uh, teaches. And Don Preston publishes this, this work right here under my, under my name, but he publishes it. But this is what I wrote. Furthermore, the first fruits metaphor also confirms who the dead are. Jesus was a Jew made like his brothers in every way. Hebrews chapter 2 verse 17. The first fruits wheat means that the harvest will be exactly like it, more wheat. In other words, if Jesus is the first fruits of Israel, then the dead that's being denied here is the old covenant Israel. Okay? I know it's hard to follow that, but that's what Don Preston's teaching. The first fruits of wheat means that the harvest will be exactly like it, more wheat. It is here that solidarity becomes evident. The first fruits are inseparably bound to the harvest, which is true. If the first fruits is right, then so also is the harvest. The dead are being raised. Also, which I have no objections to the present tenses, and we'll get into that in the next lecture or somewhere around there. Also, Paul is proving that they cannot affirm the first fruits without affirming the harvest, the dead ones. In other words, if they affirm the first fruits of which they considered themselves to be, you know, the living ones, then they would also have to affirm Old Covenant Israel, which they were wanting to deny. That was the denial of resurrection of the dead. It had nothing to do with the body. It was a denial of Old Covenant Israel participating in resurrection of the dead into the New Covenant through the resurrected body of Jesus Christ, which is no longer with us. It, well, no, it's now the church. But, you know, I'm getting ahead of myself. The quickening spirit had already been received through baptism into Christ's death and was already making alive those who received him. Even in this letter, Paul calls Stephanus the first fruits of Achaia. The same word is used here. Thus, if believers in Paul's generation refer to themselves as first fruits, then who makes up the harvest? 
when he comes, does he come for the harvest of first fruits? Such imagery makes no sense. So now I move from that into the converts of Paul. But I made this statement before. The first fruits of wheat means that the harvest will be exactly like it. And I try to make the first fruits exclusively Jewish. And then I start quoting Revelation 14. And then I start quoting James where he says we're kind of a first fruits. So as to make the first fruits exclusively the Jewish converts of early Christianity. So that the first fruits would look like the harvest of resurrection of the dead, the old covenant Israelites from Abraham onward that died before the time of Christ so that they were the ones that would be raised in AD 70 into the new covenant through the body of Christ. But then I go on and note that the first fruit imagery I noted in the book, in this, in this book, are converts of Paul. Paul was an apostle to the Gentiles, not to the Jews. Paul's converts that are called first fruits, which he calls Stephanus of first fruits, are, are Gentiles, uh, not Jews. So if the wheat looks like the first fruits, which is the harvest, then how in the world is this Old Covenant Jews. But this is kind of the nonsense that I was doing because I believed that resurrection of the dead took place in AD 70, and so we had to find a corporate dimension and then read that into the text of 1 Corinthians 15. But it makes much more better sense when it is understood that the man Christ Jesus who died, the man Christ Jesus whose body was buried, he, he was buried. Catch the power of that. He was buried. He was risen from the dead. Why do you seek the living among the dead? One of the angels said. Why do, why do you look for the living? Jesus is alive. His body is not hairy. He's alive. He's been raised again from the dead. Why do you seek the living among the dead? See, they knew what living were, and they knew what the dead was. It's a very easy term to define. So here, the first fruits metaphor applies because what is being denied is resurrection of the body. And if Jesus, Paul is arguing, is raised bodily from the dead, and he is the first fruit, and we, his people, as members of his body, are the harvest, then our bodies will be raised. Because, as I said in the book, the first fruits looks like the harvest. First fruits imagery is Jewish imagery. Before the Lord in the Old Testament, under the law of Moses, uh, they would wave the first fruits and bring in the first fruits of the harvest. And so if you brought in a first fruits of wheat, the harvest was going to be wheat. It wasn't going to be bananas. It wasn't going to be something else. It was going to be what it is. Well, if Jesus is raised bodily from the dead, and that's what resurrection of the dead looks like because he is the very definition of resurrection. He is the model of it. He's the example of it. He is what it looks like. He is what we shall be. So the harvest imagery with the first fruits imagery works quite well here and very easily. So Paul can draw this imagery up against these deniers against the resurrection of the body and say if the first fruits Christ is raised bodily remains raised in heaven as we speak then the first fruits will also look the same because keep in mind in Paul's argument uh, as he has stated here that the man Christ Jesus that was raised from the dead is the man Christ Jesus whom he is now going to get into is in the heavenlies defeating the principalities and the powers but he's doing this bodily he's doing this the man Christ Jesus it's the son of man that will send forth his angels it's the son of man who will come with the clouds of heaven the son of man will do this the man from heaven as Paul later is going to talk about Jesus the man ascended bodily into heaven and sat at the right hand of the father and currently Jesus the man who is the first fruits of the resurrection uh, clearly defines the nature of resurrection of the dead and what it looks like and Paul already hints at this in the letter the same letter first Corinthians if you go to first Corinthians chapter 6 he says, uh, food for the stomach and stomach for food, but God will destroy them both. The body is not meant for sexual immorality, but for the Lord and the Lord for the body. By his power, God raised the Lord from the dead and he will raise us up also. Okay, he will raise us up also. Paul's writing to Gentiles here. He's not writing to Old Covenant Israel, nor is he talking about Old Covenant Israel. He's writing to Gentiles, talking about their conversion to the faith. And he's saying point blank to them, 
God raised up the Lord Jesus from the dead, the one that died, the one that was buried and rose again from the dead, and he will also raise us up. He's already hinting in what we call chapter 6 of this letter. He's already going to 1 Corinthians 15. And he mentions the body here a few, few other times when he talks about the Lord's table. So just again, to catch up, Paul is affirming the bodily resurrection of the dead. He's clearly in line, as our last lecture showed, with the Second Temple Judaistic belief in, uh, with the Pharisees in a belief in the bodily resurrection of the dead. It's, it's clearly outlined in the book of Acts, as we showed in the last lecture, and therefore what he is teaching and what is naturally objected to, to this very day is objected to, is this idea of God raising up these dead bodies that have been dead for thousands of years, and how is God going to do this? And Paul is going to encounter this very objection again, which we meet with today. Uh, again, thanks for uh, continued criticism and responses and things uh, like that. I'm very encouraged uh, by them and hope that you uh, continue to stay tuned to this video lecture. May the Lord be with you.